Government 2305, Introduction to Federal Government, Module 2.02, .02, Why the Colonists Revolted. After completing this module, you'll be able to explain why the colonists revolted, as well as, as develop an academic understanding of the following important concepts that are presented throughout the module. The French and Indian War and its impact on American colonists, the tradition of self-government and representation and their impact on the march towards revolution, the Royal Proclamation of 1863 and its impact on colonial migration and westward expansion, the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts and their role in activating political revolutionary protests, acts of protest such as the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party and their role in agitating both the colonists and the British in opposition to each other, the immediate actions on both sides that preceded the outbreak of active war in 1775, and the impact of revolutionary ideals and actions on political attitudes and behavior in the present day. The roots of the American Revolution lie within a great English victory during the French and Indian War. This war was fought between 1754 and 1763 on American soil, and at the same time in Europe where it was called the Seven Years' War. But after just 13 short years later, American colonists were declaring war on Britain, with whom they had fought side by side to vanquish the French threat to lives and property. So what happened between 1763 and 1776? Well, there were two major changes occurring in the American colonies during that time. First, following the French and Indian War, tens of thousands of English troops called Redcoats by the colonists remained in the colonies after winning the war against the French. The British saw this as necessary to protect their property interests in North America, while the Americans simply saw it as an occupying army of redcoats, an unnecessary occupation of their land. With the presence of these occupying redcoats, England decided it could now enforce its own policies since distance was no longer a barrier and North America was a newfound source of land and property. This marked the end of salutary neglect and Britain began pushing the colonists to pay the new taxes that would reimburse England for the cost of fighting the French and Indian War. Bottom line, mom and dad were home from vacation and wanted to change the rules and the colonists naturally reacted with a rebellious attitude. It wasn't just Britain's demand for money that stirred up the colonists. Remember that under the principle of salutary neglect, Americans had grown used to making their own decisions through their elected assemblies. When the English imposed new taxes without the approval of the colonial assemblies, they violated the idea of self-rule. The result was an unusual revolution. Most revolutionaries rise up in regimes that have long represented, against regimes that have long represented them. In contrast, the Americans fought to preserve rights that they had been exercising during the many years of happy neglect. Historians therefore describe the American Revolution as a conservative revolution, which if you compare the violence and turmoil to the French Revolution that would happen a few years later, it really was. Personally, I often like liken the American Revolution to a teenage hissy fit where the teenager wants independence from the parents but still wants to borrow dad's car to go on a date. Beneath the conflict lay a deep philosophical difference about representative democracy. The colonists considered their assemblies the legitimate voice of the people. If taxes had to be raised, they were the ones to do it. Colonial assemblies were very responsive to the voters and their daily concerns. They managed matters like building roads and surveying the lands. Political theorists called the colonial view of governance delegate representation, which basically 
uh, amounts to do whatever the voters want. The British never understood this view of representation because they operated with a different one. Unlike the colonists, the English did not change their electoral districts every time the population shifted. English elected officials were expected to pursue the good of the whole nation. Your representative is not an agent or an advocate, argued, argued the English statesman Edmund Burke, but a member of parliament who must be guided by the general good. This view is called trustee representation. In this view, you do what is best for the voters regardless of what they want you to do. Usually, trustees will use their best judgment and follow their conscience in an exercise of trust on behalf of their constituents. Following the British victories in the French and Indian War, settlers poured westward, as can be seen in figures 2.1 and 2.2 below. But Native Americans fought back. They rallied around Chief Pontiac and overran colonial settlements in Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. To end the fighting, English, England closed the border and prohibited settlers from moving westward past the Appalachian mountain change. The colonists were stunned. The arbitrary boundary announced in the Proclamation of 1763 had been drawn amid lobbying by land speculators. The proclamation threatened the westward thrust that spelled opportunity to the restless colonists. Since American colonists or settlers did not recognize Native American rights to land that they saw uh, the prohibition of westward expansion past the Royal Proclamation line of 1763 as the act of a corrupt English monarchy that was blocking American pioneers from settling the wide open spaces that they had helped win from France. The colonists responded in their traditional way. They ignored regulations that did not suit them. But now there was a British army in America to enforce the policies. The Proclamation of 1763 was followed up by the Quartering Act of 1765, which required colonial assemblies to house and, fish, uh, and feed British troops in empty barns and warehouses at the colonists' expense. Suddenly, the Red Coast seemed like an occupying army. Britain also began to enforce its mercantilist trade policies, which meant American ships had to bypass their traditional and lucrative partners mostly the French, and do business with only the English colonies at higher prices. Colonists who ignored the decree were charged with smuggling. Wealthy merchants now faced imprisonment or large fines for trading the French colonies with the French colonies. To make matters worse, the, the English introduced taxes to help support their army of redcoats. These widely reviled duties culminated in the Stamp Act of 1765. Stamp taxes were very common as a way for the English crown to raise money. But imposing this type of tax on the American colonies launched a firestorm from, firestorm from the colonists. Rather than putting the issue to, to, of a tax stamp to the colonial assemblies, Parliament simply ignored the colonists and the representative bodies and simply announced the new tax. The colonists responded by convening a Stamp, Stamp Act Congress that met in October of 1765. Delegates from nine colonies sent a letter of protest to the king and to the parliament. And this resulted in the strengthening of colonial bonds and the weakening of the bonds between the colonies and Mother England. Protests against the stamp tax spread throughout the colonies. Mobs hung, burned, and beheaded taxpayers in effigy. They physically attacked tax collectors' offices and homes. But 3,000 miles away, the English authorities were angered and frustrated. All they could see were ungrateful colonists who refused to pay the bill for their own protection. Kind of sounds like that teenage hissy fit scenario I mentioned in the last module, doesn't it? After Parliament reluctantly lifted the stamp taxes, colonists celebrated the repeal and tensions eased until Parliament followed up with the Townsend Acts in 1767. These acts instituted a fresh round of taxes and their revenues were earmarked 
to pay a new colonial authority, the American Board of Customs, which would collect taxes independently of the colonial assemblies. From the perspective of the colonists, Britain and its bureaucratic leaders was explicitly denying the colonists their self-governance. The Townsend Acts also suspended the New York State Assembly for refusing to house and supply British troops. Once again, American colonists responded with meetings, petitions, and mobs. New Yorkers and later Bostonians seethed with anger over having their legislatures dissolved. Mobs harassed the customs officials who found it impossible to carry out their duties and called for help. A British warship arrived in Boston, discharging officials who seized a vessel owned by John Hancock, one of the resistance leaders, and charged him with smuggling. That move set off riots, bringing British troops into the city to restore order. Before long, there were almost 4,000 redcoats in a city of 15,000 people. The Boston mobs harassed the soldiers with taunts, rocks, and snowballs until on March the 5th, 1770, one detachment of redcoats panicked and fired point blank on the crowd. The Boston Massacre, as the event quickly became known, left five civilians dead. The first to fall was a sailor named Crispus Attucks, the son of an American slave and a Natik Indian who had escaped slavery some 20 years earlier. Ironically, the son of two groups who would not be liberated by the revolution, American slaves and American Indians, was the first to bleed for the cause. Paul Revere's memorialized engraving of the massacre that transformed the panicky soldiers threatened by a mob into a line of killers, firing into a heroic cluster of civilians. Historic, historian Gordon Wood described the engraving as perhaps the most famous piece of anti-military propaganda in American history. This version of the, of the events makes the British look like cold-blooded killers, not historically accurate, but powerful propaganda for independence. At the start of the crisis, six years earlier, colonial leaders had respected or respectfully petitioned the king to rescind his policies. Now blood had been shed and the colonists began to talk about rebellion. The British repealed all the Townsend duties except a tariff on tea. But to understand the relevance of a tax on tea, you must also remember that by 1773, tea was a global industry. You could think of it as the must-have product of the 18th century. But the East India Tea Company, which had a monopoly in England, was on the verge of bankruptcy. In 1773, Parliament tried to rescue the company by granting it a monopoly over the tea trade in the New World. The colonial shippers who had long been trading tea would be sh shut out by this rival trading network. When ships with East India tea arrived, mobs in Philadelphia and New York forced them to sail away without loading their cargo. But in Boston, Governor Thomas Hutchinson would not permit such nonsense. He insisted that the three ships in Boston Harbor not leave until their tea was safely delivered. So on a dark December night, about 50 men dressed in Indian manner boarded one of the ships. They hefted 342 chests of tea into the deck, onto the deck, bashed them open with hatchets, and dumped the contents worth about uh, 9,600 British pounds, about $1.8 million today, into Boston Harbor. After the Boston Tea Party, leaders were furious. To the king and to the redcoat commanders, past insubordination paled next to this direct economic hit on a struggling British company. So the English introduced what colonists dubbed the Intolerable Acts. These laws closed Boston Harbor until the PT was paid for, abolished town meetings, authorized the quartering of troops in any home in Massachusetts, and essentially put the state under military control. King George III himself put it bluntly, the colonists must either triumph or submit, but Americans refused to submit. Instead, 12 colonies sent representatives to the First Continental Congress in September 1774. This Congress petitioned for an end to the Intolerable Acts, 
called for a boycott on British goods and asserted colonial rights to life, liberty, and property. They agreed to meet again in May 1775. Before the Continental Congress reconvened, fighting had begun in April 1775. The British commander in Boston, General Thomas Gage, sent 1,000 troops from Boston to seize guns and ammunition stored at Concord, Massachusetts. Armed colonists who called themselves Minutemen blocked the way and came under British fire at Lexington and Concord. Eight were shot dead. The British found and destroyed the weapons, but their march back to Boston was horrific. Minutemen hid behind rocks and trees and sniped at them all the way home. By the time the English army had limped back to the city, they had lost 300 men. Now let's fast forward things to the present day. Revolutionary images and slogans still resonate in American politics today. The Tea Party patriots hold rallies around the nation, while Democrats discuss a Tea Party of the left. Civilians anxious about immigration call themselves Minutemen and patrol the border with Mexico. Self-proclaimed militias organize and train to defend their personal rights, and the Americans from across the political spectrum aspire to live up to the revolution's dreams of equality. The revolution left the new United States with symbols, slogans, and enduring political concerns. Arbitrary government that threatens the people, the people's liberties, but also raises a provocative question. Are Americans too quick to exaggerate routine disagreements by making analogies to the revolutionaries? So let's review. For over a century, England largely ignored its American colonies and elected assemblies governed the colonists. After the French and Indian War, the English bypassed the colonial legislatures and imposed new rules and taxes. These actions violated traditional colonial rights and exposed two different ideas of representation. The American concept of delegate representation, where representatives respond to their constituents' desires, and the English concept of trustee representation, where representatives do what they consider best for all, regardless of constituent demands. English actions also harmed colonial economic interests. Americans fought an unusual revolution. Rather than demanding new rights, they were trying to preserve existing rights and economic interests.